What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to Knights of the Pages Live. Oh, oh my god, could you fucking imagine if that's actually how I did my intro? Oh, good lord, if I ever do that, please, somebody, somebody who cares about me, please, for the sake of all of our sanity, just smack me across the face. Okay, but in all seriousness, welcome back to Knights of the Pageless Library. We are a little podcast that reviews audiobooks. I am Ryan Knight, and I will be your host for this episode. And today, I'm going to be taking a look at Fairy Tale, written by Stephen King and narrated by Seth Numerick, as well as a guest appearance by the King himself. Stephen King has a very short piece that he narrates in this book as well. Before I get into the actual review, I just want to say thank you to anybody who's listening. Greatly appreciate it. And whatever platform you're on, just please do the normal thing that everybody else says. You you know what I mean, uh, so I'm not going to bore you with all of that. If you would like to contact us directly, however, I will say that emailing us at kotpl.pod at gmail.com is still by far the easiest way to get a hold of us. So with all that crap out of the way, let's get into this one. Fairy Tale was written by Stephen King in 2022 and the audiobook version i will be reviewing came out in the same year as well um i think stephen king needs no introduction on this one you know i think if you've read any book for the past uh what 40 years now uh, there's a chance that you've heard of this man you know you've probably heard his name a time or two so i don't think i'm going to be telling you anything new by telling you anything about stephen king uh, you probably know more about him than I do, as a matter of fact. So, you know, the king needs no introduction. But how about Seth Numerick? Who is this man? Well, this guy looks like he has a few titles on Audible under his belt, um, which is where I listen to this book, by the way. I'll just get that out of the way now. Again, we're still looking for suggestions for other good places to get audiobooks. Currently... Audible just happens to be what is easiest and most accessible since we share it as a family. So it makes it very easy for us to get a hold of books as well as share them with each other. That way, you know, uh, unless they pull a Netflix, you know, and they don't let us do that anymore right now, that's just the easiest thing we can do. But please, if you have a better place or know where to get audiobooks that is better than Audible, please feel free to share that with us and we would be glad to share that with the audience. Looks like Seth Numeric is pretty... Maybe, maybe not new to the game. Looks like he has a couple books that back, date back to, like, 2012. So, but the, I've only seen a couple books here on Audible that he's done. So, definitely not, like, a, you know, prolific narrator. But I do have to say that I think he does a fantastic job narrating fairy tale. This book gives him a decent amount of range to play with. There are a decent amount of characters that he does a very good job voicing. There are a lot of male-female characters. There is some, dare I say, fantasy-type characters. He gets to play around with a lot of voices in this one, and I think he does a great job. Um, spoiler alert, I think he's the best part of this book. You know, huge spoiler, if I do say so myself. Yeah, his range for his voices is great. Um, I had a wonderful time listening to him, which is good because this book is over 24 hours long. It's, well, 24 hours and 6 minutes, so you get to listen to him for a while. I believe Stephen King's portion that he narrates, uh, I'm just going to guess, but it was maybe 20, 30 minutes or so. You know, not a whole lot. You know, when it it has both of their names on there as narrators, but this one is definitely narrated mostly by Seth Numeric. And again, fantastic job. Zero complaints from me on this one. I'm almost sad to see that he doesn't have more books under his belt because uh, he would quickly climb the ladder for me in, you know, a I would listen to his books simply because he narrates them. I thought he did that good of a job. So good on you, Seth. And I hope to hear from you again in the future. All right, so what's the genre of this book? Well, if the title itself doesn't explain it, it's kind of about fairy tales. That's, in my opinion, that's a bit of a misleading title, if I'm being 100% honest. This book starts out very unassuming, and is actually very unassuming for the first 14 hours, roughly. I will say that it 
the way it builds up is much better than the payoff you get from the build up. In my opinion, um, I thought that the first 12, 14 hours of this book is really good. Even though not a whole lot actually happens, it's relatively straightforward. Um, this high school kid uh, ends up, you know, working with, uh, to an extent, the this guy who is considered to be living in the psycho house, quote unquote. You know, he's the creepy old man who lives in the house all by himself, you know, and nobody talks to him and stuff. And, and he has a scary dog, you know, runs at the fence and barks at people and and everybody just stays away from him. And this kid ends up helping this man out and then getting to know this guy a lot, even though, you know, he's a recluse and stuff like that. But this kid gets to know him and does a lot of good deeds for him and stuff. And, and, and the main character comes from some a bit of a troubled past himself you know his uh his family's relatively broken in a sense for a while and you know he finds some comfort with this man and around the midway point of the book um it takes a hard left and then that's where we get the title from i'm not going to go too much into it now i will talk about it more after i pass the spoiler wall but let's just say there is some fairy tale involvement um, and I wasn't very impressed with it, so I'm kind of already showing my hand, at, you know, with my recommendation on this one, but I will just say that I like the first half of this book a lot, actually, and not so much the second half, unfortunately. If you were to purchase this book on Audible, you would get it for about $26.90. Um, probably a good price for the length of the book, considering it is extremely long, but... In my opinion, uh, don't don't spend the money. May, uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit once I get to my recommendation, but I'll just say that now. Don't spend the money. Don't spend 27 of your hard-earned dollars. So a couple of the big questions, you know. Uh, is this one easy to follow? Yes, it really is. This is all told from first person, um, almost in a journal entry style from our main character's point of view. Um, so pretty easy to follow you know you're not you're not really jumping around looking through other people's eyes jumping over here seeing what's gone over here no 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 it's all straightforward from this kid as if he was kind of writing a journal um, detailing what he went through so I thought it was really easy to follow for that reason is it easy listening yes absolutely I'll say it again that Seth Newmark does an incredible job on this one and again probably the best part of the book in my opinion all right so now with all of that being said <clears throat> what's my recommendation on this one if it wasn't blatantly obvious i did not like this book <laughs> um i feel a bit betrayed because i really liked the first half of the book and once it takes that hard left turn i found myself very underwhelmed and unimpressed um there's a bit of world building and things but i just found the tie-ins with fairy tales of old maybe quote unquote i don't <clears throat> i don't really know what stephen king was going for with this one basically the tie-ins i felt like that he uses for fairy tales that maybe we have all heard as kids or whatever i thought they were extremely loose and weird if i'm being honest they uh, like are out of left field pretty much um the comparisons i didn't see them at all and i would have never made the comparison if the main character doesn't do it for you uh, which is just disappointing to me it was really a bummer <clears throat> and I, <laughs> I i feel extremely let down um especially since usually i feel like if i'm picking up a stephen king novel get probably gonna get a good one you know gonna get a recommendation but this just was not it unfortunately i almost thought that the first half of the book could have stood on its own almost as its own story and i even would have <laughs> i feel like i would have liked it more if when it took its hard left um it had gone uh, almost more crazy than it did i I, I, I don't want to give away too much in case someone really wants to listen to this and they don't want it ruined for them. I was, you know, I'm 
coming off of you know listening to books like it and books like the dark tower from stephen king these incredibly fantastical out there stories so when i thought this book is titled fairy tale this will be you know maybe stephen king's take on fairy tales and i guess it kind of was but if i'm being honest it's just not very good i i really didn't think it was a very good take and the some of the other things that he kind of brings in there's a bit of lovecraft in there and stuff which don't get me wrong like would be awesome but i just thought stephen king could have done it so much better i think is why i was so let down all right i'll, I'll stop i'm not gonna keep beating this uh talking horse um if you, if you know what that's from from this book then then hopefully you got a giggle out of that um but yeah, my recommendation, I, I don't recommend this one, to be honest. I don't want you to get halfway into this and be disappointed like I was. Um, if you're a diehard Stephen King fan, even, uh, maybe not. You know, I think there's plenty of other great titles of his that you could pick up. And just, you can stay away from this one, to be honest. So, if you desperately love this book, if you've listened to it or read it and you absolutely love it, and you think I am completely wrong, please feel free to share those feelings with me. I'd love to have a conversation about it because I, <laughs> I, I don't know, can't get over this one, unfortunately. So with all of that being said, um, if you're still here, I'm going to pass the spoiler wall. So if you still just, even after listening to this, find yourself being like, I just really want to listen to that, um, or you've already listened to it and uh, want to hear what I have to say about it, Please uh, stick around. I will go ahead and talk about some of the book. I'm not going to bore you with all of the details. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it to the best of my ability and kind of give my overall impressions about it. So stick around for that. So I'm not going to do a like Sparknotes style review on this one like I've done in the past. Um, if somebody wants me to continue doing that stuff like I have done where it's very detailed, you know, right down to the minute details... Uh, please let me know, but moving forward, I'm going to probably stay away from that unless people want me to do that. So with this one, I'll probably be giving a pretty, I'm going to be doing some pretty broad strokes here. So I'm going to miss stuff. I'm going to get stuff wrong, uh, especially on this one, because uh, I've already stated I didn't care for it a whole lot. So this book opens up with a pretty strong hook um, with the goddamn bridge is how our main character describes it. We kind of quickly jump into this, you know, journalistic style, or I don't know if that's how you would describe it, but written from this main character's point of view. You know, it's all spoken through his eyes. Um, he being Charlie Reed, I believe is his name. I don't remember how long it is into the book before you actually learn his name. The first kind of section of this book basically is giving us some background that he, who's a teenager, I don't remember if he's a junior or senior, but... Uh, when he was younger, his mother was struck and killed on this bridge, the goddamn bridge. <clears throat> and there's a lot of detail about the bridge collapsing and being rebuilt and safety measures that were skipped and all this stuff. Um, and if I'm being honest, I don't remember if it actually amounted to a whole lot by the end of the story. It seemed kind of like details that were supposed to be going somewhere, but never really did. So after his mom dies, Charlie's dad ends up uh, turning to alcohol to cope with her death. Uh, this leads to like a drastic spiral downwards for him. And he ends up, you know, losing his job and just, he drinks all the time. He can't hardly function without drinking and stuff like that. And it leads to a, Charlie basically having to take care of himself a lot is kind of what I gather from that is that he at a very young age, learned to take care of himself, which that does kind of come up later. His dad eventually kind of gets out of the alcoholism by going to AA and getting a sponsor, and his sponsor helping him a lot with the alcohol and with a lot of things in his life, eventually getting his job at his same uh, insurance claims firm back. So turns his whole life around, and that's kind of where <clears throat> we're at today while Charlie is telling the story of kind of what is going on with him is after his dad's over his alcoholism and it's just the two of them kind of living on their own 
we get this kind of image that Charlie's a pretty big boy. Um, he, I don't know if they fully describe him. I want to say he's huge though. Like for a 17 year old, he's like six foot four. Like he's a big boy, um, which kind of is an important detail. Um, just kind of what ha with what happens later on to him. But what this all kind of leads up to is that he uh, one day is going by this house, which I kind of mentioned before, that uh, is known as like the Psycho House. And we get a little bit of stuff with like his friends having told him some stories about this monster dog that lives there and, and how crazy the guy is who lives there and stuff. And uh, one of these days when he's going by the house, he hears the dog barking, but it's not like a vicious bark. It's like a... Uh, you know, the dog is helpless kind of bark. So he goes into the backyard and he finds this, the man who lives there, uh, Howard Bowditch. And it looks like maybe he's fallen off a ladder and it broke his leg, so he can't do anything. So Charlie calls the paramedics, they show up and long story short, basically this guy who doesn't trust anyone, um, basically trusts Charlie with his dog, Radar to take care of Radar, who is an older German Shepherd, uh, while Mr. Bowditch is in the hospital. Charlie has this kind of weird thing going on because he is pretty sure that his dad was able to quit his alcoholism because he promised God that he would do something in return for God helping him get over his alcoholism. Charlie thinks this is the thing now. This is the favor being returned, is to help this man and help his dog, and yeah. So what ends up happening is that uh, Mr. Bowditch ends up giving Charlie the keys to his house to feed Radar, you know, twice a day. And Charlie ends up visiting Mr. Bowditch while he's in the hospital as well during this time that he has to be there. And... You know, Mr. Bowditch is kind of a cranky old man, but he kind of slowly is warming to Charlie. And eventually when Mr. Bowditch comes home, Charlie agrees to also be like his caretaker and spends a lot of time with this guy, getting to know him. He ends up like quitting uh, baseball, I think. I, I can't remember if it's baseball or basketball. He quits one of the sports um, in order to stay and take care of this guy while he's injured. So, you know, you're, Charlie seems like he's a pretty good dude, right? Like he, you know, he came from a kind of troubled, shitty past, and now he's kind of trying to make up for anything that he's done in his past with this kind of good deed, which we also get some insights on that maybe when he was growing up, kind of because of his family issues, you know, he took that out on other people in shitty ways him and this other buddy of his which i also thought was going to go somewhere but in my opinion never really comes full circle so during this whole time that he's taking care of mr bowditch too we're getting hints that maybe something isn't all normal right uh mr bowditch has this pretty decent house it's like the first house that was ever on that block there in illinois where they live um, he seems to always have money, even though he doesn't work. So we're getting these little hints, um, of things are maybe not quite right. He has a shed out back of his house that at one point Charlie hears some noises coming from. All of this kind of was intriguing to me, right? Um, we got this really slow burn story I'm thinking of all right what what is going on with this guy you know is is he a serial killer is he you know did he do some crazy stuff in his past um <laughs> the answer is uh yes he did some crazy stuff in his past but it's not not what i was expecting at all but not in a good way eventually mr bowditch kind of takes a uh turn for the worse right like he he's getting pretty old he's he's getting sick um Eventually what happens is he ends up having a heart attack and he leaves Charlie a recording to tell Charlie basically everything, right? Um, up to this point, you know, Charlie had kind of asked him about money. Uh, he had also, Mr. Bowditch had given him all of these little golden pellets to take to a guy to exchange for cash so that he could um, pay for like his hospital visit and stuff like that. This is in this tape is where he explains everything. 
And this is the point where Stephen King does narration. He narrates Mr. Bowditch's voice, which I thought was very fitting because <laughs> he he uh, uh, he just kind of I could picture Stephen King as this Mr. Bowditch character. But he lays it all out on the table. Basically, what he tells him is that there's a well in the shed in his backyard, and it leads to another place, another dimension, another world. He I don't remember all the exact details, but he basically explains that that's where the gold comes from. He explains that if he goes there, you know, maybe he should go there and take Radar there, because Radar used to go with him back in the day. And Mr. Bowditch isn't actually whatever he claims to be, 70 or however old he is. He's actually closer to 120 years old. But back in the day when he went in this place, he found that there's a magic sundial that if you turn it backwards, it can turn back the time for you. He says that maybe, you know, I, I can't remember if he says that Radar could benefit from this. Anyway, he tells Charlie to absolutely not use the thing because it comes with dire consequences. Uh, I'll try to remember to bring that up later. It's not as dire as I thought it was. So this is kind of where the fairy tale aspect kicks in. Now, mind you, by this point, we're about, I think it's right about the halfway point of this book, about... 12 to 14 hours in when you get to this point so now i'm kind of thinking oh okay he's gonna go to this fairy tale land this fantastical land in the shed in the bottom of this well that's kind of cool i'm intrigued charlie decides he's gonna go there he's gonna take radar because she's getting old she can't hardly walk anymore he's gonna take radar to this sundial turn back the time on her and to hopefully make her younger so that he can enjoy his time with her now because once Mr. Bowditch dies, he leaves everything to Charlie. So now the house, the dog, everything is his. So he decides that this is going to be the best thing for them. So he does. He goes down this well and he comes out in this place. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. Let's see. I have some notes pulled up here. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. I believe it's like Empyrean or something. But he doesn't know that right away once he gets to this place <laughs> uh it's also not quite as fantastical as you might think uh at least as far as i could tell still inhabited with people um a lot of them he sees are gray though in color like they're very drained of color the whole place itself seems very drab and dreary one of the first people he comes across is the lady in the shoe i'm pretty sure um it's just the connections I felt like were pretty weak um, and to, you know, standard fairy tales or fairy tales that most of us might know. But basically she, and I can't remember if she's the one, she can't talk, no, she can't, she can't talk because I think the she doesn't have a mouth, like, or it's misshapen, she can kind of talk. And this is, again, where I will give the narrator a, a lot of credit. I think he does these characters pretty well. These ones who are supposedly have um, some sort of disability talking or things like that or hearing later on. He does a good job of kind of embodying that and bringing that character to life. Basically, he ends up staying with this lady and he kind of gathers that, you know, Mr. Bowditch came across here and stuff and Mr. Bowditch had left his... Uh, initials all the way to the sundial and the special way to get to the sundial avoiding any trouble essentially and the initials he's following though are a b because when howard bowditch came here before he was he had a different name uh i cannot remember it off the top of my head it was adrian bowditch once he turned himself back on the sundial he came back as his own son back into the real world that's why he changed his name so Charlie goes on and he ends up meeting um, this other lady who can't talk, but she has like no mouth. Uh, she can talk through this horse. <laughs> that was my joke kind of earlier on about beating a talking horse. Um, he meets this guy who's blind is the next one he gets to. Uh, and then he meets this lady who can't hear. So we got uh, see no, hear no, speak no, I guess turns out we find out much later on that these three are i'm probably gonna screw this up completely they are 
old royalty from this place. Their family, we keep getting the names, this name, um, Flight Killer, keeps coming up. And this other name that had come up before is uh, Gog Magog, I believe is how it's pronounced. And I don't remember where he initially hears these things. Um, to be honest, I, I don't remember. Basically, he finds out from these three individuals, right, that like this land used to be very different and things, things kind of suck now because of this flight killer guy. And, you know, they're the previous family, you know, the monarchs, um, they uh, everything was much better, brighter. So but Charlie's like, well, I just got to make my dog younger. So, you know, that's all I'm here for. So he ends up having to go into the city um, and he's told that he can't be in the city at night. Basically, he has to hide anytime it's at night. You know, classic trope. There's also like a giantess in the city, uh, Hannah, this huge, disgusting giant lady. Basically, he ends up sneaking through the city. He, um, no, uh, let me go back and mention a couple s silly details that I forgot. Uh, in the real world, he came across some dude after Mr. Bodish died, who was going trying to steal the gold, that he believes also killed the guy uh, who Charlie took the gold to initially. And he keeps mentioning that this guy's like a Rumpelstiltskin character. Well, it comes up again once he gets into this world because he stops some dude from torturing this giant cricket. The creatures in this world, the insects are pretty big. That's what's also been coming out of the shed is these cockroaches. That's all it is. They can't breathe our air, so it doesn't really matter because they can't get out of the shed basically anyways. But that's why Mr. Bowditch had everything like boarded up and locked and covered. He meets this um, other little, little, I don't know, goblin dude who was torturing this cricket. A red cricket, not a black cricket, a red cricket. That will come up later. Kind of. <laughs> um, and he tells him off. Anyways, uh, he gets to the sundial. He turns it back he puts radar on there turns it back like six times which i guess turns her back like six human years i think so she's much not younger now she's much stronger i'm just going to mention right here that the problem if you use the sundial since i forgot to bring it up later is that uh it'll make you sterile that's uh that's all that's that's the whole uh thing that'll happen like it'll make you younger but it'll also make you sterile uh but of course you know he doesn't make it back out of the city before dark gets captured by the night night guards what are they called night guards night night watch night soldiers the undead night soldiers uh super <laughs> super cool name he gets put in like a prison with all these other guys <clears throat> and he's also been finding out like as he's been going through this right that it's not normal like everybody else looks like humans but it's not normal that he has no, uh, he's not turning gray at all. And I can't remember what he's called, a whole one, I believe. And he finds out when he gets in this prison that all these other guys in there are also whole ones. And he finds out that they're basically going to have like some gladiator style games for the flight killer. Because that's just what they do. There's not, basically they round up all of these whole ones and they put them through these gladiatorial gladiator style games in order for them to kill each other off which you know make sure that none of them can uh rise up to defeat the flight killer who th through a series of events we find out that anybody who is a whole one is essentially descendant from the original monarch family because they slept around all the time and were just like having babies all over the place but they are immune to the the gray or whatever it is that's affecting everybody else which is why this flight killer guy he wants everything gray and dreary and we find out it's just because he's also like one of the brothers i guess from the original family but he's like a quasimodo character <laughs> he's all jacked up and basically hates everybody and so now he just wants everybody to be miserable like him it's kind of what i gather so they go through these gladiatorial games and while he's in prison, he also, like, his hair changes color. Like, he was brown eyes. He had brown eyes and uh, brown hair. And his hair, like, turns blonde and his eyes turn blue. And they all start calling him the prince, like the foretold prince or some something like that. They go through the first set of gladiatorial... Gla oh my gosh, I'm going to stumble across that word <laughs> for the rest of this episode. 
They go through the first set. They get narrowed down to like 16 people. Charlie did have to like fight for his life in this thing too. He fights some dude, some crazy guy. He ends up killing him. But it's just, I, I don't know. It should have been very intense. And to me, it was just all very kind of low key downplayed. In, in my personal opinion, he takes those 16 people and they essentially figure out that they can overthrow these night soldiers because they're like undead dudes that are like skeletons surrounded by electricity is what I gather and they find out if they throw water on them they explode which was that's kind of cool he basically is going to get out but he's also then going to uh, restore the monarch family back to their original prowess because you know that's what one does when you're in a fairy tale is you just you can't just be good enough with escaping, saving your life. You gotta, you gotta restore the whole world. It's the red cricket too that comes back. I can't remember. It's like some deity thing in this world that this little gremlin dude was like torturing, and it comes back, and it's basically what helps him escape from prison. It also ends up leading them to, you know, the end game essentially. It's really weird. And the girl who had no mouth earlier is the like the rightful princess or something like that i honestly i don't really fully remember but he falls in love with her of course like he only talked to her for a little bit through a horse and he falls in love with her through that time so he is going to go through all of this in order to restore her back to her rightful place now we're also remember the gog magog thing so that comes up here towards the end when they all escape they basically have to get the princess they have to get rid of Flight Killer, which is their brother. Uh, I don't remember his name at all. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick, because not that it really matters. Elden. Oh, yeah, like Elden Ring. <clears throat> they, He's going to do some ritual with this Gog Magog thing, I think. I don't really know. Basically, they go to, like, they go up this tower. They pull, like, a real Dark Souls 2 thing. They go, like, up this tower to get to another place by going down these stairs. They get to this basement. This is where this Gog Magog thing is. It's like a Cthulhu monster. It's it's directly referenced as like a Cthulhu Lovecraft mythos monster. And it's literally just under an actual literal hatch in the floor. I, I wasn't very... Like I'm just picturing this giant wooden hatch. Uh, old school medieval hatch. And it has like a crane over the top that's like lifting it up. And this monster starts to come out, and it turns out that Elden already made a deal with this monster, which is why he became, like, powerful, and he killing all the butterflies, uh, which I guess were, like, the source of the beauty in the land. I, I don't know. He has, like, tentacles. He's, like, an Ursula character, and Quasimodo. Like, he's just got the worst of both worlds. But they gotta convince this princess that he is a piece of shit. She's gotta, like, help kill him. Then they got to stop Gog Magog, and of course Charlie can do it because he knows Gog Magog's name, and he basically... For somebody who wrote It, and the final confrontation with It and the Deadlights, this was so underwhelming. Like, literally, it's just Charlie, like, yelling at this Cthulhu monster, and he's like, You get back in there, Gog Magog, I'm telling you right now, I know your name, so you get your ass back in that, in that dungeon down there that you live in. And that's going to be that, mister. And he does. Like, it's literally what happens, you know. And of course, they, like, they win, right? Like, they restore everything. Charlie gets wounded during all of this, too. I don't remember what happens to him exactly during the end fight thing. But he's recovering in the hospital. And for some reason, I guess uh, Stephen King just had to throw in a sex scene in here. It's not even really a scene. This later this lady and I don't even remember who she is from earlier in the story comes in and talks to Charlie for a few minutes goes back out comes back in in another set of clothes and then they have sex uh, but it's there's it's not described in any way I just didn't feel like it added anything and I was shocked that it was left in there in the final draft and Charlie's all worried because he doesn't want basically like he doesn't want anybody on Earth to find out that this place is down here because they'll just come down and, you know, ruin it and because they, uh, they there's gold down there. So he also is like, oh, it's like a layers on layers thing, like the Gog Magog's down there 
and they don't want him to come out. Well, we don't want him to come out to Earth either, and I don't... Anyway, he ends up, like, having all this great time with all these people in fairy tale land. In the end, like, everything goes back to normal. He fixes everything, essentially. Restores the monarch family back to their original prowess. Then his hair, like, immediately changes colors back to brown, and his eyes go back to brown because uh, he fulfilled his destiny, I guess. It's a real kind of, like... Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe scenario, if I'm being honest. Um, but I feel like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe did it better. I should have mentioned this earlier, too. The book is also way too self-aware for my taste. It's mentioned often, you know, where he's talking directly to you, as in, like, oh, but if that happened, then you wouldn't be reading this. Or, you know, if if this and this happened, then why would I be telling you this? I'm not a fan of that kind of stuff. Just a nitpick by me, but I'm, I'm not a fan of it. So Charlie goes back up out of the well with his young dog, Radar, that, you know, he finds a way to say that he got a new dog, is what he tells people. Anyways, they board up the place. He's been missing for like four months. So it's not a Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe scenario in which no time passed while he was in there. Time in the real world was passing, you know, and his dad was worried about him. Basically, he explains the whole thing to his dad, and his dad's like, Oh, okay, dude, that's cool. Like, and now we got all this money because, you know, Mr. Bowditch still had, like, a whole five-gallon bucket of these little gold BBs that we could sell, and and we inherited all of this house and stuff, so it's cool. No big deal. And that's it. That's seriously it. They also end up cementing over the well so that nobody else can go down there, as if, you know, that's going to... A wooden shed with a little bit of cement over the top is going to stop anyone from getting in there if they really want to. Um, in the long run, technically, <laughs> not a whole lot changed. Um, I was disappointed to find out that none of like the... I thought maybe the bridge was going to come back up from earlier. I thought all these things that kind of affected Charlie in his real life were going to come back up in the fantasy world. And to me, I didn't think... Any of it was vindicated. I <laughs> I didn't do this whole explanation of it justice, but I did not. I didn't like it. I was not impressed, and I was very disappointed. Because I, again, when I pick up a Stephen King title, I'm usually... Even if it's going to be weird, it's usually going to be in a good way. I There was not a whole lot I liked about this one, aside from the first half of the book. To be honest, the... I thought that the setup was going to be crazy. Uh, you know, there was going to be some crazy scheme and stuff, but there's just not. And I feel like the payoff of him going to this other world is not that impressive, if I'm being real. It feels like a almost like a campaign written for a Dungeons & Dragons game, but I feel like there's Dungeons & Dragons campaigns that would be written that are even more creative than this. I didn't think that anything about this stood above any other book that's done these things before. Like I said, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I felt like did this, you know, going through uh, some sort of portal to a new world type of thing much better than this book does. And I, god damn it, I was going to make a Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe joke earlier <laughs> when he went down the well, I was going to say, and then he goes into the wardrobe, I, oh, I mean the well, it, uh, anyways, that's stupid. I shouldn't have re the joke, because it's too late now. <laughs> but, okay. This this one's getting long. It's getting already up to, like, the 40-minute mark. That's too long. I said I wasn't going to do an in-depth uh, look at this one, which is not really in-depth, because, like I said, the book's 24 hours long. There's a ton of stuff in here. Just not a ton of payoff, if I'm being honest. So, yeah, that's that's what I have to say about Fairy Tale. It, it was unfortunate. It was a big disappointment and a letdown for me unfortunately so if you listen to this one if you read this one whatever if you want to know more about this one please feel free to contact me kotpl.pod at gmail.com is the best place to send that stuff let me know what you guys think uh, again if you're still here thank you so much for listening i really appreciate it and let me know what you guys think what i should listen to next yeah Hope to catch you guys in the next one.